Hello everybody. In this video, we're going to talk about how we can measure the concentration of suspended sediment by satellite. So the video is going to have three parts. What is suspended sediment and why do we care? How is suspended sediment measured? And then I'm going to show you an example from the Amazon River. So first of all, what is suspended sediment? As rivers move downstream, the currents transport uh, pieces of rock, sand, and grains of sediment. If it's big, it goes in the bed load, which bounces along the bottom. If it's small, it may travel as the suspended load. And that literally means that as the current carries these things down river, these suspended particles, they never hit the ground. They're small enough that they stay suspended. So we're talking about uh, things you know, less than 100 microns down even to 2 microns or 1 micron, clay particles, uh, organic particles, things like that. And they're different than the dissolved load, which actually is single molecules or ions that are actually dissolved in the water. So here's what a high suspended load looks like, aka a muddy river, right? And here's what low suspended lo load looks like. And the difference is that this river is actually carrying a large amount of material. If you add up all the suspended load, all the pieces of clay and sand that are afloat, that actually adds up to a huge amount of material. This is a very important process. And it's important uh, for several reasons. One is uh, it determines habitat for aquatic species. right? Some uh, aquatic creatures like to live in muddy water. Some die if they're in muddy water. So it's important to understand the distribution of suspended sediment load for habitat and watershed management. Um, also, uh, small suspended particles tend to be very reactive. They can bond to nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and actually carry them efficiently downstream. So wherever we see high suspended load, we're often going to see high nutrient loading as well as shown in this example from the Mississippi River Delta, where the Mississippi brings down uh, sediment and nutrients from throughout America and drives uh, eutrophication anoxia, and eventually what we call a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, where creatures cannot live because there's no oxygen. So understanding suspended sediment helps us understand problems like this. Uh, also, from an engineering perspective, um, suspended sediment must settle out somewhere eventually. And if it finds a quiet harbor to settle out in, well, it can, it can silt in those harbors, as shown here. And that can lead to a lot of expensive dredging, as shown here. So high suspended sediment load can equal a lot of expensive dredging uh, if you're not lucky. And then also, suspended sediment can be a proxy for soil erosion and deforestation. If you follow suspended sediment, it may lead you back to uh, poor practices like deforestation and soil erosion. And then from a more of a broad landscape perspective, suspended sediment uh, is this fundamental way in which mountains are carried to the sea. Right? This is part of the rock cycle. And so if we, if we study uh, tectonic geomorphology or fluvial geomorphology, we care a lot about how much sediment is moving down rivers, even to the point where people have done global estimates of sediment yield. Good, so I hope you believe this is something that's worth measuring. And it turns out that this is something we can measure quite well from satellite sensors. And here's why. When you fill the water column with a lot of sediments, those sediments are actually reflective. They scatter light very, very reflective, <laughs> effectively. <laughs> and in particular, uh, the visible and near-infrared wavelengths bounce off of sediment particles. So this is essentially Lambertian scattering from a previous video. And so the more sediment you have in your water column, the brighter your water gets. And right, you think about that. Clear water is dark. Muddy water actually is, is almost bright, even approaching white sometimes. However, it's interesting. As all these photons bounce around here, we do get some absorption as well. 
And so we can see that if you look at this example from a laboratory study by Mertes et al., um, this is wave. This is a reflectance spectra of water with different concentrations of suspended sediment. So this axis is the fraction or the percent of photons that are reflected at any given wavelength. And what you can see is that um, water with a low concentration, 5.6 grams uh, milligrams per liter, is not reflective at all. And as you up that concentration to 570 milligrams per liter, we get a lot more reflection, especially in the near-infrared wavelengths. However, notice that the shape of this curve is actually changing as well. It's not just getting higher. It's actually shifting off to the right. And we're also developing some troughs, like this one, which is actually uh, due to absorption of photons by water at around 800 nanometers. Nonetheless, you can see that the reflectance value at any given wavelength is very closely tied to the concentration of sediment in the water. And in particular, the reflectance value kind of around here, maybe between 600 and 700, or around 650 nanometers, is almost a linear, almost increases linearly as a function of suspended sediment concentration. So if we can measure that reflectance value, we can estimate suspended sediment concentration. So how might we do this then with satellite imagery? Well, we take an image. We need to make sure that we're in units of reflectance and not radiance. And you can see previous videos for that explanation of that. Um, and then we're going to compare. Uh, we're going to take measurements of the reflectance spectra from different pixels in our satellite image. And we're either, either going to compare them with laboratory spectra, like I just showed you, or perhaps with field calibration samples. Perhaps someone's going to go out and collect uh, suspended sediment samples at the same time that the image is being captured. And then we can either use processes like uh, spectral mixing, if you want to involve all of the spectral bands, or empirical calibrations, if you're just using a single band. And so I want to build on this idea of kind of an empirical calibration using a single band. And I'm going to do that with an example from the Amazon River. So the Amazon River is the biggest, one of the biggest watersheds in the world. It contains four of the 10 largest rivers in the world. And as a result, exports a huge amount of sediment each year. There's been a really interesting project, the High Bam project, that has been monitoring uh, suspended sediment concentration at these sites throughout the basin and actually using those in conjunction with uh, remote sensing images to estimate, uh, make very accurate uh, average estimates of suspended sediment flux. It's also an interesting area because it's really subject to a lot of intense deforestation over the last uh, decades. These areas shown in red are areas that have experienced a lot of forest loss over the last 25 years. So you might ask the question whether that is actually uh, accelerating suspended sediment concentrations and suspended sediment <laughs> flux over time. And this is also a perfect place. The Amazon River is remote, right? It's a place that you, there's a lot of parts of this where you do not have any data. So actually getting estimates from satellite images lets you reach uh, and study areas where you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Likewise, the Amazon is big. Uh, so it's, it's a good target for remote sensing. And here's an example image. Uh, the satellite sensor that's been used most effectively to measure suspended sediment in the Amazon and elsewhere is the MODIS sensor on board the Terra satellite. And here's a true color image of the Amazon River Delta in 2017 uh, taken from a MODIS image. It has 36 spectral bands, which come in three different resolutions. And typically for suspended sediment concentrations, people use band number one. That is this uh, 
620 to 670 nanometers. It's that exact wavelength range I was just pointing to, where there's a linear relationship with suspended sediment concentration. And sure enough, we do see that linear relationship. Um, this is a study by Martinez, 2009. And on the x-axis, we have uh, suspended sediment concentration. On the y-axis, we have reflectance in band one of the MODIS sensor. Really, really nice correlation here, which lets you estimate suspended sediment concentration if you know the reflectance value of the MODIS image. And from this study, we've been able, they have been able to determine that uh, there is a decent correlation between sediment concentration in the Amazon and monthly precipitation. So it is the wet season that generates the most uh, suspended sediment, which isn't surprising. Perhaps more surprising, though, is that using MODIS images over the last uh, two decades, they've been able to show that, in fact, sediment load has actually gone down, apparently, over the last roughly 13 years in the Amazon basin. And that's despite the fact that runoff has actually gone up slightly over that time. So it's an interesting paradox that despite accelerated deforestation and slightly higher runoff, uh, sediment load has actually gone down over time. So interesting question for further study. So in summary, uh, suspended sediment is an important factor in water quality, nutrient loading, and coastal engineering. Um, essentially, increased reflectivity changes the spectral signature of water. Um, sediment concentration can be measured either by spectral mixing or by linear interpolation, uh, often using MODIS band 1 reflectance and plotting that against uh, suspended sediment concentration as measured in the field to create a calibration curve. And as I just said, it requires calibration using field-based measurements, as we just saw. Thanks very much.